we were so quick to throw away our monarchs in Africa and we thought, okay, they were so crazy and whatever. But come on, the UK has the long standing uh, monarch. Most uh, European countries have their own monarchs. So why are we then made to believe that when it's our thing, it's oppressive, it's not right, there's something wrong with it, it's backward. podcast the africa we want and tonight it's christine and chedo back again and it's very nice to be discussing a topic that's going a bit further from last week's topic on african culture and gender stereotypes this week we'll be discussing about like the african culture gender roles and this is all to you know like start from what were the roles that gender had and then how much of that is changing or has changed and how much of that should change and how much of it also possibly is within the African culture or is it just people opting to like uh, pick gender roles that favor them, whether because they are male or female or yeah, that's the reason why they pick them or is it because the culture uh, people are faithful to culture, you know, people practice their culture. So I will let you know, uh, say hi. I know I've highlighted quite a bit of this, but generally the topic is on gender roles. Chido, say hi, and then we will get started. In fact, Chido, you could start by sharing your thoughts on the topic. Chido? Uh, hi, Christine, and thanks for yet another episode. It's Chido. And I'm really happy to be back so that we continue on the discussion that we were having last, last week. Um, yeah, I think, Christine, you can go ahead and give a broader context. Then we can, you know, discuss from there. Try. Okay, okay. So the broader context of this is, uh, so right now, if you've had a lot of discussions with a modern day, let's say, woman, you hear them say that I don't want to be told these are my roles because I'm a woman. For instance, I ask Christian, do I want to be told that uh, because I'm a woman, then my role is to prepare a meal, is, is to take care of children, is to uh, clean, is to you know do certain kinds of jobs which would be more associated to women than to men. What if I'm a man and there are roles that someone has in mind because you're said to be a man. If, for instance, you can do manual work that requires, you know, like strength, and does that mean that just because you're a man, this is the job that you should do? Of course, some of these things are really obvious because uh, if someone is to lift a log, and it's, it's unlikely a woman uh, may easily lift it as a man would, like all factors held constant, not that they can't, but all factors held constant. Or, uh, and especially that's a narrow focus we're looking at it, a role that you're given and you're, to, you're told uh, because this is who you are uh, sexually, then it follows this and this is what you do. Can, for instance, a man say, I actually do prefer to make food for my family. I prefer that every every night I make dinner and every lunchtime I make lunch and I make breakfast. And that doesn't mean that there are any less of a man in that home than a man who prefers not to cook. Or let's say a man says that uh, doing this kind of job, I really do not enjoy it. Uh, that should not make them any less of a man because they don't enjoy it as much as other men do. And also, I think something that I have said that someone would wonder is that you're told this is what should be done. So who tells you? Where did even these uh, roles come from? Who defined them? Who said that this is what a man should do and this is what a woman should do? And that's why we are narrowing it down like from the African culture. Is it the culture that has influenced this? And I know uh, depending on each person's faith, coming from whichever persuasion of things that you come from, you may also borrow from that. And you'll find that within the African culture, of course, uh, there are different faiths that are practiced, you know, and these also seem to, like, have their own definitions of these roles. And 
some of them enrich in them, others insist on them, others, uh, you know, modify them. But there seems to be almost a common consensus even within, like, the African culture where there was no Christianity, where there was no Islam or any religion being practiced then, uh, a woman going back would have been the one who would be a gatherer where the man would go hunting. So, Chido, that's, that's the concept, broad concept within which uh, I'm proposing to like speak about it, like gender roles uh, and where they started from, and also how much of the modern day thought that you should not uh, have a role attached to a person because they're a man or a woman influences this within the African context? And is there any influence at all, or is it the same things that are being carried over? Chido? Uh, thank you so uh, much, Kristen. I hope I got um, your question well. But I'm just going to say this, okay, that I think um, the issue of gender roles, in as much as it may be a sore subject for quite a number of people, I think... Um, how gender roles are defined is something that has been in, that is probably entrenched in our blood, our bloodstream or whatever. Because if you look at it, if you look at the period before um, colonization, uh, I'm, I'm referring to that period because it's during colonization, the, during the advent of colonization, that's when, that, that's, that's when we started having religion, Christianity coming into Africa and, and so forth. So the period, the pre-colonial era, right, where everybody was pretty much practicing African traditional religion, gender roles were clearly defined. And I think I, I say this in last week's uh, podcast session that men were hunters and women were gatherers. Men would go to till the land and women would stay home and prepare food and, 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 and meals. And then we had the colonization period, right? And we had Christianity being introduced. And I'm going to speak uh, in relation to Christianity because that's what I'm familiar with. I, I, I would not want to assume in respect of other religion. Uh, again, gender roles seemed to be very defined, even if you go to the Bible, which would also make me come to this conclusion that even in the even in the Islamic um, religion, the Jewish the Jewish people, again, they were so defined that you had, um, you know, Cain and Abel being, I mean, Abel being the one, Cain and Abel being the one either heading the sheep or probably tilling the land and no one ever hears of um, a woman being in that uh, particular space at that moment. So the point being, it must be something that is inherent within us, right? But having said that, let's not uh, lose sight of the fact that globalization has come in and introduced what I would say a system that is a bit more flexible, right? So we now have men getting into uh, professions that were ordinarily thought of to be for females only. And by that, I mean the beauty industry, uh, designing, um, you know, being chefs, you know, working in, in hotels and restaurants and whatever. And you have women also now crossing over into professions that were ordinarily thought of as being masculine. I'm going to talk about bus drivers, you know. I'm going to talk about being mine workers. But in, in as much as there has been such a shift in perspective, particularly in respect to employment, I don't think there has been such a shift when it comes to what happens when we get to our homes and i feel that it'll be very ridiculous i'm going to say this but yeah it'll be very ridiculous in most african people's eyes to come to your house christine and then find your mother sitting on a couch legs uh, stretched out and your dad running around in the kitchen preparing a meal for her i'm not saying it's something bad but i'm saying society looks at it as if it's very ridiculous Society hasn't gotten to a point where it has accepted that as reality, right? I, I would imagine that your aunties and uncles would come in and have a fit come finding such a, such a picture. Mm -hmm. But we are now moving to a society where boys are being, you know, taught from a young age to do things for themselves that ordinarily were just set aside for women, right? I gave an example, I remember, of my young brother. I think I was talking to you privately that he knows how to cook, he knows how to wash for himself, he knows how to clean after himself, right? And this is a 16-year-old boy, which basically means that even when he gets married, 
he goes into marriage knowing how to do that. And likewise, we also know how to till the land. We also know how to, you know, cut open logs and do all those other things that ordinarily we set aside for men, which basically also means that I can go into marriage. I know how to, to screw up a door. I know how to fix up um, falling cupboards, right? It's okay. But I think it's still going to require more for society to accept that it's okay for a man to know how to cook. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, Shido, it does. And I think for someone who is not African listening to this, it almost sounds very ridiculous because like I've, I have friends who are not uh, like African whose dads have the so people who prepare meals in their homes. Like the mom never ever makes a meal except when uh, the mom wants to fix a meal for herself. But the role of cooking and doing uh, shopping for groceries, all that is left to the dad. And I know someone... Uh, someone lis- listening to like even how such a person, my friend listening to this, they would wonder what, why, why is how does anyone still think uh, this way? But that's the thing that it is a very common thing, Chido, as you're saying that there are things that will not be expected. That you find a man uh, who is married has a wife and and they are washing uh, and cleaning after themselves. And then they, after that, they just go prepare a meal for the wife and for the kids. And not just once off to please them, but continually on a continuous basis, you take it as if it's a responsibility. So it's, it's actually quite a lot of cutting up that has to be done. And this is also looking at like women equally contribute to the income of the home. So you find that even today when I would go to work and I would earn a good income that I'm contributing to the home, Yet the man is like uh, seen as the breadwinner, but that's not always within the African culture. Is still very strongly uh, looked upon that a man should be the breadwinner. But although that's uh, sold out to be the case, it's not always the case that uh, the man is the sole breadwinner and the women are not like working or bringing in income. They are, but despite that being the case, it's still looked upon that the man should be the one to. Uh, cater for the bills. The man is the one who's supposed to pay the school fees for the for the children. The man is the one who's supposed to buy the house or or make sure that they uh, provide for what you know that sort of thing for the family. And you will find that it's a very common thing that you hear being said within like uh, African homes that if a man is just sitting at at home and the wife is working, then uh, that that's really not a good thing to look to look at. But in reality, it happens a lot. You find that the woman really in that house, uh, she has to be the one working and she has to cover up for the man. So most times you find that kind of scenarios that the person cannot even admit that the reality is that she is the breadwinner for the family because that almost uh, makes the man look bad in that scenario. And and so it's it's quite a big uh, shift in mindset if you ask me that you need to be done. And especially in today's world where where I think Chido and I think I would like to hear what your thoughts are is that for the woman, gender role seems to be still seriously taken. Like for instance, you still should come from work and make a meal and wash the child and do these things. But what's the role, what's the gender role that a man should have in this day? when the woman is equally providing and sometimes even providing more than the man, what then should be said to be the role of, of the man? Because it looks like for the man, and especially these days where women are also encouraged, uh, very much encouraged to work, and which is a good thing uh, that they work, but especially where a man says that I cannot understand why a woman should sit at home and, and, and not work. The same way women say, I also cannot understand why a woman should sit at home and not work. So there's a greater and greater drive for women to be in the workplace and to bring in sufficient income for the family. So then my question is, uh, and yet at the same time, they're expected to play these roles or that a woman should play. So my question then is, what is the role of a man in today's world? What's, what's, what is his role in the family? Chido, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. 
I'm going to sound very, I don't know, traditional or whatever, but I think let's try to let's try to come back from westernization, okay, and actually be practical and be Africans, right? The point I'm trying to make is in Europe, it's very possible to come across a guy who's comfortable with making less than the wife does or being a stay-at-home dad. But that's not something that is possible in Africa, right? So the biological makeup of every man, Christian, they have ego. You know, when everybody talks about, oh, men have ego, men have ego, mm -hmm. that ego goes at, over and beyond being the provider. So the point I'm making is every guy who's sane, I mean, who is up, okay upstairs, sane, is born with this inherent desire to provide. That's how men are. So if, so basically he would rather go and slave himself at work and work four, five, six jobs just so he can provide for his family and not have his wife mandatorily pay towards rentals or bills unless she insists. There are very few men that are comfortable with staying at home and having their wives go to work and be the breadwinner and whatever, because that's not how it's supposed to be. So the problem that we're having with today's society is we demanded for women's rights, right? Rights to equal and fair opportunities. And we got that. And now we are demanding for equality in marriage, which is something that is, um, I don't know, maybe, well, it's, equality exists, but there is also the issue of complementarianism. Complementarianism basically saying that men and women are different. They are equal in an institution but they've got complementary roles that they have to perform so that the family goes on, right? Let me give an example of uh, childbearing and, and, and taking care of the child, right? It's very important that in the formative um, years or probably months after childbirth, that the child actually has, a, a, like, has the mother present and bonding with the mother. No matter how much you might try to be a stay-at-home dad and take care of your baby and, and feed their bottles when she's, six, when she's two months old or whatever, it's still not going to make up for the bond that the child is supposed to have with the mother. It's not the society that made it like that. It's not African religion or tradition that made it like that. That's, that's biological makeup. So already, now the, you say the problem, I'm, I'm going to probably jump and get to another point because of time. So the problem that we now have, because everybody is, is, is now trying to do this and trying to do that and trying to split things and do all these other things, we now have dysfunctional families because it now it always comes back to the family being the core of a society and being very functional, right? So now let's talk about um, helping each other in the house. I don't think it's something bad that if I get married, my husband would want to help me change the diapers or cook. But I feel like it's not, it doesn't necessarily make sense, baby, from a cultural perspective or from a religious perspective, or from a conscious perspective, that I actually draw up a duty roster to say, he cooks on Monday, I cook on Tuesday. He cooks on Wednesday, I cook on Thursday. Because that, that because it just does not, I, I don't know if I'm making sense. I, I, I know that legal arguments say we should do this and whatever, but I'm talking about the practical things that happen on the ground. It does not make sense. And I tell you that in a normal functioning home, it does not make sense for a husband to say to the wife, you're going to pay rentals next month and I'll pay in July and you pay in December. It doesn't work like that because a man prides himself in knowing that he is providing for his family. He's sending his children to school. Let's not talk about, yes, there are instances where he probably becomes incapacitated or is no longer working or is, you know, is disabled and cannot fend for himself. That's a completely different uh, situation. But for an able-bodied man, that's why, Christine, if you've got male friends, they will tell you that they will never marry until or unless they get a financial muscle. It's because he was built to be a provider. Chido, uh, okay. Chido, you, you've said a lot. Possibly it has to do with the male pride, that someone feels like I... I, I want to walk on the streets and say, yo, that's my family, I take care of it, you know. That's my wife, and especially in the African country, I paid dowry for her. I gave 10 cows. <laughs> so maybe maybe that's something a man wants to walk, to feel, so that no one will ever question is, I don't know, his data uh, in society as this 
to give you an example, I, I think we've seen quite a number of these memes and people have been laughing about it, right? That, you, you know, dad. So p- people are like, who is mom? Who is dad? Who is the sister? And it was like, dad is the person who has no idea what's wrapped up in a pr- present that's written from mom and dad. If, if you notice this, right? It, it, it has nothing to do with a man being irresponsible. It's just his instincts. A man, who, you never go and ask your dad for where your stockings are as long as your mom is alive and you're still staying with her. Highly likely he doesn't even know where his socks are, no matter how organized he can be, right? Because that's how it is. Women, I remember, I think we were just having a, a, a random conversation and I was telling you that no matter how much a guy can be good with interior decor and you know being organized and whatever, his house will never be a ha- it will never be a home unless it has got that feminine touch. And that's how we were made, right? So if then we then ask a guy who obviously does everything by the book to make a house and convert it into a home that is actually welcoming and habitable, I don't think that's practical. Because having a home is not just about cleaning. It's not just about cooking. It's not just about welcoming guests. But it's the warmth. I don't know if, 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 if you can relate. It's, it's the emotion involved. And men really do not have that, which oh. is a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's why you realize that. I, I know that we, we, we as women, we try to, we are very strong, like we are really strong people, but we are so much in touch with empathy. We are so much in touch with our emotions and feelings as compared to men. Men are very practical. Okay, okay. And, and yes, and, and, and that, that touch with your emotions with empathy, with, with, you know, with your feelings and whatever, is what makes you as a woman unique. It doesn't make you less Christian. It doesn't make you, um, you know, less equal to your husband. It just makes you a unique human being who is actually able to relate and create an environment that is welcoming for everyone and warm. So, you know, what are your views uh, on like where the world is pushing, especially, and I know you've spoken about this in the past, where like even the the woman, uh, you know, emotional side, which you just mentioned, which is something that's very common, you know, you are empathetic, you are emotional, you, you are happy and for some reason you feel like you want to cry. And you really genuinely want to, you know, like scream because you're, you know, happy. So, and not even that, the fact that almost being emotional or sen- sentimental is seen as weak. And anything weak is to be despised. First, it's the fact that it's seen as weakness, not as a characteristic that's just different from, uh, from a man perspective. So that if you're at work and for, for some reason you, you, you're emotional and that's just your makeup, it's seen as weakness and you said uh, like a woman can't lead well because the emotion gets in the way. So, Chido, I don't know what, and, and so over time, and I think you notice this from social media sites and if anyone hasn't noticed it, uh, emotion is really being shown as weakness and is being criticized. And that's why you hear someone telling you, stop being a CC, stop being uh, like a small girl. In fact, that's a common thing you hear someone who's referring to someone who is either haired or who doesn't look like uh, they have courage, you're like a small girl, or you hear someone saying, uh, if we are fail- if we are not being welcome uh, into this economic club, you're being treated like flower girl. So, Chido, this very disdainful way of speaking about emotion and the entire feminine thing, what's your view on that? Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to start talking about emotion in the corporate world, right? And then emotion at home, right? Okay. So I was made as an emotional being. It's not by accident, but it was supposed to be like that. It's by design, right? So Christine, you know, I work in international development, right? I actually need to empathize with people who are on the receiving end for me to be able to come up with policies that are actually beneficial. So it's not only just about, you know, being practical. Let's go and, uh, you know, let's go and create a special economic zone over there or let's just get into this trade agreement. But I need to actually empathize with the the 99% who are supposed to be beneficiaries of whatever policy that we're creating so that at the end of the day, they, they benefit, you understand? 
So if we're talking about moving people out of poverty, right, I need to empathize with people who are living below um, a dollar 25 cents a day for me to actually feel the pain that they go through and have that fuel me or be my or, or push me to want to see their situation change. Now, the reason why you find that most of uh, government policies in, in, in a lot of like we've constantly lamented about how sometimes our leaders are not, it's because they are not empathetic, like they don't really tap into that emotional side and actually understand the plight of the person it, uh, like on the ground. So you realize that a corrupt person does not feel anything for anyone. They are selfish. They are driven by trying to achieve their end goal. And I feel like if we continue suppressing emotions and not being able to be in touch with our feelings generally as human beings, we then you lose the humanity. I remember having a conversation with my lecturer uh, who taught me about, you know, law and technology. And he said, you know, the one thing that's going to make us human beings remain, remain valuable or remain relevant in an era that is technologically driven is our emotions. Because as soon as we get to smart cities and, and you know, we have digitalized everything and we now have, you know, ro robots coming in and telling, you know, being our shop attendants and working and doing all these other things. What's going to be important is what makes us human beings, what makes us different from robots and machines. And that's our emotion. So if the effort the industrial revolution is going to show as what it actually means to be human. Because if you're going to buy something with the shop, Christine, you need a sales person who can actually sympathize with you. You know, uh, I, I, do you think you're a size five? No, maybe you might want a five and a half because your left foot, like, the person is able to relate to some of those things and that's something that a machine cannot do. So I feel like we are now living in an era where we're trying so hard to push ourselves to be machines that are emotionless, that don't feel anything because we think it's efficient. But I don't think it's efficient in the longer run when you start talking about humanity and being human beings. Emotions at home, right? We, are, we grow up in a society that tells boys not to cry. And the reason why we have got men who cannot feel anything who go around, you know, I mean, a lot of people who go around committing heinous crimes, Christine, it's because they are not in touch with their emotional side. They don't feel pain for somebody. They don't feel pity for someone. It's just about them. So we are actually creating a society of monsters, a society of predators. I've always said to my young brother, if you feel like you need to cry, cry, let the emotions out, right? A lot of people right now, Christine, are depressed and they can't even speak about it because it's being emotional. Society has not opened up to that. That's a conversation for another day. People are committing suicide because they have bottled up a lot of emotions that they were not allowed to express by society because it makes them weak, it makes them shallow, it makes them vulnerable. But that's how we are supposed to be as human beings. We are driven by emotions in a way. You know, uh, these are very good thoughts, and especially uh, the point where you mentioned that a corrupt person possibly is an empathetic, doesn't care about any other human being other than enriching themselves. Uh, quite a good perspective right there. And I think for tonight, we'll just end the discussion at this point uh, where we've touched, I know, like on a bit of different things here and there, but the whole thing was to try and see, uh, like, what is the gender roles within the African culture and how we've gone to like our makeup on whether we're emotional or pragmatic makes us fit for certain roles or or let's say gravitate towards certain roles. So that if I am if if I don't like shouting and screaming I'm a more calm person then you may most likely not uh, gravitate towards a, a, a kind of being that requires these other these other things. So in the same way, if I seem to I seem to be empathetic and to you know like want to think about that a person, which I think every human being should try and do that way, because that's the only way you can relate to another person, getting to know what their perspective is, and what really they are about, what they enjoy, what they think, and that's really what it means to relate to another person. You can you can never relate to a person by getting stereotypes about them or generalizations or you say women are like this because uh, when you're speaking to Christian, you're not speaking to women, you're speaking to Christian. Or when you say women like flowers, 
women may like flowers, but when you're speaking to children, you're speaking to children. So I think just having that uh, as a human being, you need. I would, I would say you need uh, the emotional element. It's not even the emotional, the, the, the ability to relate to people which has to do with emotion and also the practical uh, aspect of it where it's not all emotional, but you actually, maybe if someone is hungry, you need to give them food, the practicability of it. But uh, maybe the whole uh, sum up of this uh, discussion on gender roles within the African culture is it looks like we are still there where people, where we haven't fully moved out of it, but where there is greater and greater influence of globalization and what you do on social media, for instance, where you see this is what how parenting looks like in, in, in 2021, you know, like you sit with your child and, and you pour your hearts out to each other as as you take photos of a kind that that you express it, it to each other how you're feeling. Uh, yeah, so anyway, Chido, I don't know uh, what your closing to back are on this, and then uh, we'll call it a podcast. You raise very important uh, points, Christine. I feel like, I, okay, I, 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 this might be a very controversial statement, but I think we we need to understand that Yes, globalization has really helped, you know, making the whole world a global village. But there are certain things that we necessarily do not have to adopt because we now can see it on social media and we can now, you know, try it out. We, we lose our uniqueness and our Africanness, which has been our identity for a very long time. And I think this is becoming a problem, especially with most Africans. You have other people still holding on to their... Uh, to to their cultures but we are slowly losing it and it's losing its value which was obviously our seal of uniqueness i remember talking to a friend about how we were so quick to throw away our monarchs in africa and we thought okay they were so crazy and whatever but come on the uk has the long uh, monarch most uh, european countries have their own monarchs so why are we then made to believe that when it's our thing it's oppressive it's not right there's something wrong with it it's backward but when it's being done by developed countries we think oh my word this is the new the, the new level of democracy or new level of emancipation i think this again comes back to the conversation that you had with paul with prosper about how we just have a lot of things shoved down our throats and we accept it it's not just political so just economical it's even social because we're now even changing who we are and how we've always been simply because we are being told it's backward. And I think we need to tap back into our Africanism. We need to tap back into what actually makes us unique as a people. You know, I think now certainly the discussion that we will have next is, is African culture barbaric and backward. And because that keeps coming up in small uh, aspects whenever we are discussing and Someone says, you know, uh, just because it's African, it's written off as, you know, barbaric that needs to change. Well, at the same time, there's someone doing the same exact thing. And for them, it is the way to go, you know, like, uh, what, what, what's up with that? Uh, thanks, Judo, for coming by uh, tonight. Uh, for our listeners, uh, we really enjoy having these conversations. We hope you enjoy listening to them. Uh, you can leave your comments. You can even join us uh, whenever you listen to this and want to be part of Africa I share. We can have you as a guest, so write to us, and we look forward to having these discussions next time. Uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>